lot of you have seen this presentation a couple times and uh, have heard through other projects uh, quite a bit about Yellow Tang. Um, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of review and then we'll get into some new preliminary data that we've worked up only just recently and, uh, and then I'll just end with where we're hoping to go with this. So uh, Yellow Tang, as many of you know, is a very common reef fish in Hawaii. It's the number one aquarium collection uh, in Hawaii and from uh, mostly, most of the fish are collected in Kona and upwards of about 300,000 individual fish are collected in Kona, it's estimated, in any given year. And uh, through work of Brian Tissot and uh, Bill Walsh and several other researchers, it's been shown that these aquarium collections are impacting the uh, numbers of yellow tang on reefs in Kona. And uh, we're interested in trying to understand whether the MPA network that has been set up in Kona and has been proposed for elsewhere in the states will be able to replenish uh, reefs outside of protected areas because uh, being an abundant herbivore on reefs in Kona and elsewhere in the islands, uh, the yellow tang has a, plays a very specific role in keeping down algal biomass and then maintaining the health of reefs. So yellow tang, uh, they, as they are generalist herbivores, but they have a planktonic larval duration of 60 days. So they do have the potential to get around. Uh, it's throughout the islands during this larval phase. So as larvae for 60 days, they are offshore, and we're trying to understand to what degree these larvae may be dispersing between the northwestern Hawaiian Islands monument and uh, the main islands, or just among islands or among sites within an island. So thanks to cooperation of uh, NOAA and DAR, we were able to make, uh, able to sample populations throughout the archipelago. This included a number of sampling sites in the newly created monument, and then also a number of sites in the main islands, including each of the major islands, and then on the big island, we, uh, we were able to sample multiple locations around the island. Uh, and then also, uh, fortuitously, we were able to collect samples at Johnson Atoll, and relate those to our samples in the, uh, in the main islands, in the Northwest One Islands, in order to get some idea of whether there is larval dispersal or this distance between Johnston and the uh, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is approximately, I think it's upwards about 1,000 kilometers of open water between these two areas. Uh, so we're looking at the population genetic structure of yellow tang in order to infer larval dispersal within the, this, uh, this species in Hawaii. In order to do this, we worked up a 16, 614 base pair region of the, MT, mitochro, the mitochondrial DNA. And, uh, and then we also looked at 14 loci, microsatellite loci. The mitochondrial DNA, we, we were looking at specific sequence differences among individuals. And what this does is allow us to compare these sequence differences among individuals and give us some idea of the evolutionary history of Hawaiian yellow tang and a, uh, um, a basic understanding of large, uh, large temporal patterns of larval dispersal in Hawaii. <coughs> and then we were using the microsatellite loci, which are highly variable repeat segments within the nuclear genome. And these will, uh, were allowing us to examine uh, finer resolution patterns of larval dispersal within yellow tang. And so in order to do this for, to, examined a, a sequence difference in the MT, mitochondrial DNA. First, we had to develop species-specific primers, and then we applied those to uh, 583 samples that we were collected throughout the islands. And these came from, I think it was compared, for this analysis, we compared 18 sites, uh, and this included a number of sites on the Big Islands. And then with the microsatellites, the uh, establishment of these loci is quite a bit different than uh, working up mitochondrial DNA in that it requires first isolating the, the target region that you want to amplify, identifying it, isolating it, and then developing primers for it, and then optimizing the, well, screening those, the low cells loss side to see if they perform according to assumptions of the statistical models that you'll be using, and, uh, and then uh, optimizing your PCR conditions for all of these various loci rather than with mitochondrial DNA, you're working with just one loci, one locus. Um, so in order to develop the 14 microsatellite loci that we've decided to go with and apply to yellow tang, we did this through two stages. The first was through collaboration 
with uh, um, Brian Tissot and uh, Mark Hickson and Mark Hickson's gra graduate students at Oregon State to screen 30 previously identified uh, microsatellite loci. These loci were identified through Hickory funded work um, to develop microsatellites for applications of yellow tang. And so we were screening these to see, to uh, examine their utility in our project and, uh, and to work them into our study. And then we also isolated and screened an additional 384 candidate loci. Uh, this was work done in our lab and uh, included the screening, of, isolating and, and screening of these loci and then optimizing uh, PCR conditions for a, a smaller candidate set of loci. In the end, we ended up selecting 14 loci to apply to yellow tang for this project. And uh, we genotyped, with these loci, with these 14 loci, we genotyped 687 samples, which uh, means uh, just about 10,000 individual PCR reactions. So the screening and the opti PCR, optimizing the PCR conditions, that actually <coughs> took us right up until uh, mid-December, and then the actual genotyping occurred right through Christmas, and these samples were just recently scored. So any of the data that you see derived from microsatellites is a very fresh analysis and uh, is preliminary at this point. So for the mtDNA analysis, what we have basically uh, within Hawaiian yellow tangs is a number of closely shared haplotypes. So what this, this is a TCS plot representing the individual haplotypes that we observed in the population. Of about 580 samples, we found 25 closely related haplotypes, with each circle representing a unique haplotype found uh, in the islands, and then the size of the circle being proportional to the number of individuals that shared that haplotype, and then the bars between the circles representing the number of differences, the actual number of base pair differences between these haplotypes. So basically, what this means is that in Hawaii, we have a number of very closely related haplotypes, meaning that for throughout the archipelago, what it, we have a signature of either recent population expansion uh, or a small effective population size. And the idea, the potential for recent population expansion in Hawaiian yellow tang is actually been seen, the signature for this has been seen in a number of other fish, and it's thought to be associated with uh, past extirpation due to glaciation events and changes in sea level associated with glaciation events and then subsequent expansion of populations, recolonization of habitats. And so it's assumed that during the, uh, about 10,000 years ago during past glacial events, the, uh, the sea level change in Hawaii may have forced a number of species to retreat further south and then have since then recolonized north into Hawaii and or just expanded populations from refugia within Hawaii. But there is also the potential that we have, <clears throat> while we have a very large census, census size for yellow tang in Hawaii, there is a potential that we have every year only a few adults or just a few populations contributing to the overall, to the cohorts of any given year. So which would ultimately give us a signature sim similar to this, which creates, in essence, a bottleneck year to year where not all individuals give a, a share a similar um, uh, success in reproductive success from year to year. So for our, our mitochondrial DNA analysis, overall first we look at each population, each sampling site independently, and then we run a test for geographic structure, which basically what it does is tell us whether the, uh, the distribution of haplotypes is non-random re in relation to geography. So when we do this, and when we keep, consider each site independently, we do have a, a signature of significant genetic structure within the islands. 